Dan, why don't you kick us off today? We're just to. gonna <laughs> we're gonna rip this band aid off. We're gonna go for it today. So, yeah, it's gonna hurt. I'm sorry. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh, it's gonna God. hurt so good. Um, it's gonna hurt so good. Yeah. Because I think this is a this is the issue right now about tennis and tennis coaching. Whether you're a player, whether you're a coach, right? Something is something something's happening. Something is changing in tennis, and it comes down to this idea that you need to do more, more and more and more and more and repeat and repeat and go on a loop like this. So the idea was that you've got to. Um, go out on the tennis court, okay? And look, if you hit a thousand balls, you're doing good, right? And if you come back and you did, look, you go out and play a match after that, right? And you lose, it's because you didn't hit 2,000 balls, right? So the next time you go back out and we go, do, do it, all right, let's hit two. Have you, have you done 2,000? I've done 2,000, ready to go, yeah? Out he goes again, right? I'm, um, I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit 3,000 next time, okay? All right? No one ever questioned that. No one had ever questioned. It. And look, I've been traveling around and um, I was employed to like, write some of the courses uh, for coaches, at, you know, at a high level. And for at least 20 years now, the wisdom, the received wisdom we had is, look, you need to play and repeat and repeat and hit loads of tennis balls. And if you're not doing that, you're lazy and you'll never be very good, right? You're never going to achieve that level. Look at all these, look at all these guys who are, who are competing at the moment. They hit thousands and thousands of tennis balls. I went along with that, right? And I would go and I'd, I'd do the drills myself. I compete. So I thought, right, I'm going to do all this drill 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 look and i got really good at it and my shots were fantastic my drills were just awesome okay problem was i kept losing and do you know what my response was right i need to do more drills right i need to hit a two thousand more tennis ball that was the reason i lost didn't hear enough and then i'd say when i started working with certain three years ago something when ah light bulb moment ding like this and it was is it really a good idea to keep hitting all these tennis balls and it came um in a different way it came to me when i was um, practicing on the golf range right I, I started doing my golf right and i got a bucket of balls for the driving range and i put them down and i spent an hour and i hit loads of them i went out on a golf course it took me the same amount of shots to get round. doesn't matter how many of these balls I'm hitting and I'm thinking what am I doing and then the, uh, it was actually my dad said to me look you don't need to go on the driving range you need to play and I go okay and then I thought does that apply to tennis and I thought right I'm going to stop the drills and I'm going to play sets instead and I'm going to speak to Sterling wow what happened I just I started beating the people that I've been losing to it's as simple as that and in my coaching courses, I stopped, I stopped doing the ones that where we would teach these repetition drills. Because it, it was giving everyone a great buzz. Everyone loved them. They were addicted to these drills. I'm going, oh, Dan, I want more of these drills. Can, if you've got more of them, we'll, we'll just keep doing them, doing them, doing them on a loop. And the other thing was that I noticed the big difference for me was the fact that with these drills, that most of the academies that I know do them, most coaches do them, but they never measure them. Right, it involves no measurement whatsoever. Right? So there's no counting involved. There's no scoring. So you can't really see any progress at all. This, I think, is the, like, the tragedy of tennis right now. Right? It's killing people's games. This idea that you have to do more and hit more balls without actually thinking about anything. Right? You, you, so you go out there, right, I could hit my thousand, and I, not a thought would pass my head. No, no idea of. Uh, the the sequences two shot sequences and it's a real problem right now okay and it's certainly one that at the art of winning we're going to be looking at and addressing far more head-on than we have done right right until now okay 
And I think with what Sterling's going to do today, is we're going to be looking at those videos. We're going to be looking at exactly um, what it is that we should be doing. Look, there's going to be some repetition involved, but it's what you're repeating and how you're doing it that really matters. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to you, Sterling. All right. So, yeah. So one of the things that I began to look at, you know, more than a decade ago was this idea of what kind of repetition do we need? No one's going to argue that the more you repeat something, obviously the better you get at it or the worse you get at it, right? Because it depends on, are you intentional about repetition, right? And so uh, one of the things that we define when we started the Art of Winning together, Dan and I, is we we put together 12 universal principles and, you know, principle nine says that the tactical controls or determines the technical. And, and then we have 10 is the, the distortion of perception is the emotional response to a current belief, right? So when you have an emotional response to something, okay, like if you go out and hit a ton of balls over and over and over again, you're going to start to feel good if you start to make them emotionally about that situation. But that can distort your perception about what it takes to win the match, right? Because when you're just repeating the same stroke, there, there tends to be a very uh, a lack of, of tactical application there. And especially when it comes to what it takes, you know, the ball coming back to you. Because when you just repeat one ball after another, the ball's not coming back to you. So there, there's no this, it's not this sense of resetting after that shot you just hit. It's resetting after the ball that maybe your coach is about to feed to you again, which is usually a ball that's in your strike zone, unless you're, you're, you start to expand that as a coach and mix up the feed. So, um, and, and that's that whole discussion of block versus random feeding. Um, but the idea that, if your tactical is pre-programmed, the pre-programming of the tactical decisions that you make in a match to win, it's usually most often excluded in practice because the technical advancement is the dominant mindset. So the answer to the technical becoming better technically is repetition, right? Instead of where are you going to hit this ball? And then when the, why are you hitting this ball? And when are you going to hit it to a certain spot on the court? And what's coming back to you and how to respond to that? So I want to go ahead and I want to share my screen because I want to show uh, sort of kind of get a visual understanding of what I'm talking about. And this is an extreme. Obviously, we're looking at the extreme because we want to we want to show people what we're talking about. Now, this is a video I found on YouTube. And the name of the video is 150 Stroke Tennis Rally, right? And so I did, well, I just disappeared. There we go. So I want you to see this. Like, I'm not sure, like, how wonderful this is, right? To hit 150 balls over the net in a row. But, like, this doesn't, what is this really doing? These players are barely moving. Oh, yeah, their swing path is pretty cool. You know, oh, yeah, they're receiving the ball, you know, off to the side, but basically they're hitting it right back to each other. All right? So that's the first video. So I just want to ask you, does it look anything like this? And I know this is Rafa and, and Tommy Ribeiro, but look at how they're warming up for the U.S. Open. All right? This is what winning a point looks like, right? They're trying to actually win the point. They're starting with a serve and a return, right? They're resetting, playing the S1, resetting, playing the R1, resetting again. Next two shots, right? That's nine, ten. Oh, man, we're getting an extended rally. But, but this is what an extended rally – you know, this is what an extended rally looks like when you're actually competing to win the point. There's a big difference in hitting a ball over the net cooperatively and then hitting a ball over the net competitively. The mindset, the emotions change. 
this is why, you know, my friend Craig O'Shaughnessy coined a phrase beautifully years ago when he said the practice court is broken. And, and when I met him, I echoed that with the data that I had from junior tennis over three years of data, you know, thousands and thousands of points we mapped with, with the obvious evidence. It's a, different, it's a different game when you're playing and keeping score, right? So then I started to think, okay, we need to do this in our matches, right? We need to, we need to look at – or sorry, not our matches, our practices. We need to look at our practices. Are we scoring? our challenges, our drills, right? Is there a scoring aspect? Number two, is this scenario ever going to happen in a match? That's the second question, right? And is it, is it match court mindset first and then practice court mindset? I want to introduce you to Trinity, who's next to me. She's a player of mine. You know, Trinity came to me. She was uh, 14 years old. And she had uh, aspirations of playing college tennis and, and whatever beyond that, if she could do it beyond that. But her first aspiration, we kind of uh, worked together with that goal, is to play college tennis. And so I took her on. And, and I, I'm going to ask her some honest questions, and hopefully she'll give you an honest answer. But, you know, Trinity, compare, you know, let me just say this. So, Trinity, you're going to play Division One college tennis coming up this year, right? Yes. What are you going to play? At, are you going to play at the school of your choice, or did you have to settle for some another choice? No, I'm playing at the school of my choice. So, so she had she had her number one choice where she always wanted to play, and then she had some other, and she got a lot of inquiries from D two, D three. Um, when you looking at your game now, and looking at what it was when you came to me when you were 14 years old, and that's been what three years now. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that coming in at 14 that you had a chance of playing in college tennis? Um, not really, not with the game I had. Okay. So that's and, – and, and I, you know, we basically had to do a lot of technical work with you, right? We had to – basically we had to almost start over. There were some things you did really well on each stroke, but we basically had to break everything down. Now here's yeah. the big question. How much time out of 100%, so 10%, 30%, 50%, how much time in the last three years have we actually rallied in practice as far as what those guys, what those guys you just looked at right there? Like 5%? 5% of the time. Yeah. Okay. And we trained about six to eight hours a week for the last three years. Now, we did do some drilling, some challenge, right? We had to work on those forehands going out wide and all different types of forehands and all different types of backhands and volleys and overheads and transition. And, but, but we put it in what? Challenges. We scored everything. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Like what did that make you feel when we started doing this, the art of winning, sort of transforming the practice court way versus before you came to me? Well, before I came to you, I was just rallying and doing drills. I never really played points. And if I did play points, it was probably like two hours out of the whole week. And so now when I did play points, I started to feel the pressure of competition more often. And I started to become more comfortable with it. So then I was able to put all the strokes that I wanted to use in my points and put them into competition. All right, so one of the things we did, and, and Trini, I talked about this, and we did this every day, is we would go work on a stroke, then we would introduce it as this is what it would look like if we played a point. This yeah. is where it's going to show up. Can you, do, can you duplicate what you just worked on with your contact moves, with your movement, with your reception of the ball, sending the ball? Can you do that under pressure, scoring in a point situation, starting with a serve and return, right? Yeah. What do you think the biggest part of your game you struggle with for years that you feel like you've kind of got a handle on that and we've tracked this? This is not a trick question. You should know this. The return of serve, right? That was your big thing, right? And so, but we didn't just work on the return of serve, did we? Right. No. What, 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 how do we do that? Um, we worked on the return and return one. And right. So we worked on those two shots in sequence with one another. We did spend some time and isolate just working on returns, right? But then so we, we immediately – what's that? We would still reset after that. So, like, I would move to the next shot. 
there you go. And not necessarily play it, but you would reset, right? Mm -hmm. So we really emphasized what was happening between the shots, the movement, the resetting and things like that. You know, Trinity is a perfect example of a player coming to you if you're a coach. And, and, and if you're a player and you're seeing this for the, you know, this is kind of a new revelation for you. You don't get better winning matches by just spending, you know, 90% of your time or 80 or 70% of your time rallying the ball. You've got to actually break this down into, I'm going to serve and play the S1. Maybe we, did we not play the next two shots after that a lot of times, Trinity? We did. Yeah, so we went two plus two, and then, and then we basically ended the point a lot of the times. Yeah. Um, how did, how did your extended rally, when you started to play tournaments and extended rally shot or nine shots or more, what was your win percentage on extended rally? Um, normally I would win most of my extended rallies. It became easier for me to stay in the point more because I was using one, two reset and ball player. So I didn't really think about the shots I was going to hit and just thought about the sequence. Yeah. So that's really interesting to me as a coach and it really, as, as your coach, it, it basically put the nail in the coffin of you don't have to rally long in practice to train to win those long points in a match. We train zero to eight shots about 90% of the time. So that's four shots for me, four shots for you, or if we, I had a, we had a hitting partner for you. And then we stopped the point, and we scored it in different ways. But you actually – your win percentage on extended rallies and matches actually increased tremendously. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had the data because we've mapped a lot of your matches. Most of your matches we map. So that it works one way, but it doesn't work the other way. Right. And so that's what we discovered. Um, what do you think is the number one thing in your mind that you feel like you got out of working this type of art of winning mindset practice court? Um, my whole mindset basically changed by the end. So all the emotion that I used to play with has subsided. I start to think more throughout my points, start to make more better shot selection. And I think that improved the most. So before you came to me, you know, you had this isolated shot making, trying to end the point, right? Yeah. One shot at a time. And then by training two shot sequences, you know, one, two, and then reset one, two, and then uh, basically played tennis in, in a sequence, sequential way, right? So that one shot related to another and then you were resetting and looking for the next two shot sequence that opened up to you. Uh, how much time do you think we spent on zero to four? So that'd be serve S1 or R&R1. &R Out of 100% of the time we, we, play, we, we practice in three years. Like all, most of the time. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was like 60, 70%, honestly, yeah. you know, and, and some weeks we would take and, you know, we would work on some of our intan the intangibles part of your game, but, but that's not what, you know, that's not, that was an addition to your game. That was, that was playing that slice when you needed it. Right. But for the most part, you know, where do you find when you go to tournaments, you find what shots do you play the more often than any other shots? Oh, my first two shots, my serve, serve one and R and R one. And we know that because we've been mapping with the tennis map play out with Trinity and even her mom would go out and do point tracking with Han, you know, um, it was really interesting. We've seen her numbers gradually get better over the years. Um, you know, at first as a player or in a coach, you might see this in your player, you might get a big jump in success, but over time it's small incremental changes, but that, that goes along with the idea you only have to win 55% of the points in a match, right? How did that statistic really help you mentally going into a match? Um, it made me think I really didn't have to do as much to win. So I just needed to make my first two shots and stay in the sequence, and I would probably be fine. There you go. Uh, I didn't set myself out as much. Awesome, awesome. All right. Um, I want to go. Thanks, Trent. That was, that was great. I mean, it's always good to have, you know, someone other than Dan and I to actually, you know, <laughs> talk about this and from an experimental way, like a player, like we picked up, you know, Annie is the player that's been on a lot of our calls and Dan is working with her in the UK and she's just starting out and she's having the same revelations that you had when you first started out with me. And, um, let me ask you one more question before I share a screen. I'm going to share uh, one more thing with everyone. 
What do you think was the most difficult obstacle for you to overcome in your mindset? And how do you think, you know, thinking about the way we work the practice court, how did that help make that transition? Um, I would say it would be the emotions because I got hand handle of the tactical and the strategy portion of it because I knew what shots to hit and how to hit them. It's just I needed to execute it. And so the only thing that was stopping me from executing it was my emotion. And what allowed me to get over that hump was thinking about what shot, what target to hit and thinking about my margins and thinking about connecting my shots in a two point sequence. So that thinking about those things and putting my focus towards that kind of took my emotions out of the game and allowed me to play. So targets, the court, we, we, we kind of designed the court where we would, we would make the court thinner, right? We play Blackbeard and, and Slim Jim. These are the court, you know, uh, names and way we would set the court up. But um, what about momentum scoring? Can you talk a little bit about how momentum score helped you emotionally? Yeah. Um, momentum scoring also is kind of like a calming mechanism too. A lot of people say, uh, breathe, breathe through the shot, or go back to your racket, or adjust the strings, which is good, but the momentum scoring allows you to focus on the point more than what you're actually doing, so when I know the momentum score, I know who has the momentum, and how it's going to shift, and what I need to do to get the momentum to come back to me. Okay, so it just help with the decision making, but also the emotional response to either being down a point, up two points, you know, being up two points, you knew you were, there was trouble coming, right? Cause it's a little bit more difficult to win three in a row than just to break someone's momentum. Right. Did you, did you notice that was the case? I mean, is what I'm saying, you know, pretty accurate to what you felt? Once I started using momentum, I started to notice it a little bit more often. So I knew when someone did win two points, I was like, Oh, okay. It's more likely for me to win this point now. Or when I was up two points, I said, okay, I need to focus on my one-two reset and just play steady to, to get my conversion. Right. So, and these are all the things we work with Trinity with, with, you know, what kind of patterns are steady for her, right? If she's down, if she's up two zero in momentum, right? So let's say a game score, she's up 30 love. That means she's up two zero, maybe three zero because she may have won the last one of the last game. But basically – what is a what is a strong pattern for her? How does that feel to her? You know, does you know what makes her comfortable here? And and then when she was she was down two points or down one point in the momentum score zero one, what was the pattern that she could go to that she felt like man I can steal away steal back the momentum? So um, I want to share my screen again, and um, and I want to I want to take us through. This is what the portal for the first strike builder looks like if you're if you become a member of the Art of Winning. And so you know you can go through. We have like the three types of serves. We kind of define the three areas of the service box. The primary first strike patterns. We'll just go to Deuce Primary. I just want to show you kind of what it looks like here. You have a video that has all the twi twelve primary first strike patterns for the Deuce Court because. We have finite patterns that are available, okay? You can click here and go to diagrams, and it's going to show you the diagrams for these. There's the video again. So one of the first primary patterns if you're serving to do so is an outside run, okay, which is a wide serve. And then if you get a forehand, you reverse. You reverse the player coming back. Now, this is – and then you can go through and look at each one of these. But these, I just wanted to show that. To those of you who are watching, this is what our porters look like at the Art of Winning. Um, we have several porters that have different topics that feature different areas of the game. This is the first strike builder. Um, Trinity, how did this help you define the primary first strike patterns? Um, well, now I know what – what my strengths are and what I would normally go to to hit. So now I know exactly what pattern I would use in a pressure situation and I know how to affect my opponent. So now I can look to see what my opponent's struggling with and then hit to that, hit to their weakness. 
Right. So what we did was we took these patterns here and then we kind of, you know, ran through all of them with Trinity. We, um, we made sure, okay, which ones were she really strong at, which ones she sort of had a little bit of weakness there. We kind of divided them up into columns and then we were able to go back and revisit. Right. And, and, and really, you know, even though this is a structured system here at the art of winning, it, it, you in, you tailor it to the player, like the personality of the player, what the player feels, right? This is how you make a player strong mentally, emotionally. You know, they know what they want to do, when they want to do it. And then it's about the execution. The one more question for you, Trinity. The emotional strength that you gain by pre-planning your first strike patterns, whether you're serving or returning. Well, well, pre-planning my patterns really made it easier for me to execute them because I knew exactly where I wanted to go. I knew exactly what portion of the court to hit to. It's just became automatic for me. And so now when I played a point, I, I didn't think about it anymore. How did that help you respond when you missed? Maybe you, maybe you made an error on your first strike pattern. How did that, how did that help you not respond negatively and re respond more positively? Well, because I know exactly where I'm going to hit, I can now observe what I did to um, create the error. So instead of me judging myself, I could say, oh, um, I hit the ball too high. It went too high over the net, or I needed more spin, or I needed to change the speed of the ball a little bit more. So that's a perfect example, you know, that Trinity makes or gives about being able to control your emotions is if you know where you want to go and you miss it, you become more observant. And you, and you move out of that house of judgment, as I talk about. And you don't judge yourself as a bad player or even bad person for missing, making error. You, and you realize that you're going to make errors, but the idea that you had a plan and that's what you were going for, it helps you move on to the next point. Um, so that's great. So, um, Dan, I know you've worked with, with, with Annie a little bit, and you're going to work with her again. Can you, can you kind of confirm, deny, or anything Trinity said and maybe what, you know, the things you've worked with Annie, some of the topics? Yeah, I think. With regards to when we're on this thing of yeah. repetition, right? So, so go ahead and talk. I want you to talk to that emotional response and repetition because Trinity's just pointed out that her repetition was very targeted to what she will experience in a match. Yeah, I think um, – there's a, there was a slight difference between you working with Trinity and what I've done with my players because I think Trinity was kind of in, she kind of grew up with this if you, if you know what I mean she was you were brought up on, on yeah this sweet, she's sweet young yeah. um, and and that was great when I start to introduce it to players right it's really really difficult all right and I have to allow for about about an hour and a half of resistance. From mm. them. Oh, and wait, let's, let's time out. Trinity, did, did we have resistance in this? Yes. A okay. lot of <laughs> okay. No, you, did you? Yeah, like we, she and <laughs> I, you know, it was because she would go off and play and turn and then we would talk about the match and you, she had to come around with her perception, right? Would you agree with that, Trinity? Yeah. It took a while for me to kind of adjust to the idea of it, but it was the way he was teaching was different than everyone else and everything, everything else wasn't working. So I was like, okay, I have a few more years left. I need to figure out something to do. So I might as well try this. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, I mean, the first... The first point of resistance is very much something like, um, I would, with a lot of players, they go, look, I'd like to start doing the planning. I'd like to start doing the two shot sequences that you're talking about, but my timing's not, what, it's not right, okay? It's not there yet. I'm going to need to rally to get my timing, okay? Or I need to warm up, or, and so on. Right, um, that that was the I'd say the first point of resistance, and then I think a lot of people, well, I'd say everyone who plays tennis, because the whole culture of tennis is 
obsessed at the moment with the technical, right? It's like a prison that we've got, uh, right? Our mind is locked into technical solutions to these, to these problems that face us when we're competing, right? And people will say, look, the reason I lose now is because my backhand's really weak. Yeah, how many, how many times do we hear that? The poor backhand gets a battery, right? And that's, what, that's quite interesting when you take players out for the first time and you introduce this art of winning work to them. They say, oh, Dan, I'm sorry about my backhand. And they're literally standing there giving their backhand such a hard time. And I don't know if you've ever read The Inner Game of Tennis. She has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They talk about self one and self two. Yeah. And so the self, you can literally hear them talking from self one down to the, the, themselves, the other self, self two. They're going... God, why is your my back your backhand so rubbish though? Why don't you do this or why don't you turn earlier and all this technical stuff? And the self one is hammering self two. The, that was part of the resistance. That yes. and on that first day, there's almost this rage against um, from self one on self two. This war that happens, and you can it's going to happen during a match, right? They end up losing because they lose this war that's going on in their head because. You cannot execute technically perfect. You're looking at the wrong thing. And they're fighting this war when, in fact, there's something very different going on in the match. That's the real problem. They're trapped in this technical. They really are. Okay? And, look, you've got to have, you've got to, to break out of this takes some courage. Yeah, Trinity, when you came courage. from the other place you were at, you, that was a very technically mindset-driven environment, was it not? Yes, it was. And then how, you know, was it resistance to try to, you know, how much, how did that go for you as far as resisting that, trying to have that, you know, I got it, it's my forehand, it's my backhand, because we went through that with you. Yeah, I think in the environment I was in before, it was just every day was tech, technical work. So I would just spend an hour doing technical work and then they would say the reason that I wasn't winning was because of my technique. And so that was drilled into my head. So I thought it was my technique when I came to you because that's all I knew. And so it took me a while to just let it go because what else do I know? And I think it was just um, the point of just trusting it. I mean, you're just going to have to trust it because there's no way of like peeking around the corner to see if it's going to work to get out of that mindset, I just had to trust it and just take the full lead. So we took your technical adjustments that we made and obviously we made a lot. And if you call, if you, you, if you track my Instagram account and I've put up sort of before and after pictures with Trinity serving and things, you, you can see the, the, the transformational change in your technique, but we did it in the context of where you were going to hit the ball, when you were going to hit that, you know, forehand over the shoulder or, Rafa finish, if you will, or driving the backhand versus looping the backhand, right? But we did it in the tactical context, right? Mindset. How do you feel like, do you feel like training the technique in the tactical mindset actually helped your technique further along and, and actually increase it better or faster? Uh, yeah, definitely help faster. Um, I think it's because I was actually doing it while I was learning it. So I was able to feel what it felt like and just mimic that motion when I would try to play it. Right. So again, you know, working, you can work on technique coaches and players playing points out and point scenarios out in practice because you're actually working on the technique in the context of, of hitting a pattern and moving and then just having the emotional – dealing with the, the pressure or the negotiating of the emotional response if you lose in the score. So we would do things like, okay, if you make both shots, Trinity, you get the point. If you miss one of them, I get the point. You know, and then we would keep score that way. And how did keeping score affect you – affect your technique, if you will? Or how did you adjust your technique when you started to keep score in practice? Um. I think my technique kind of came with the point. Like I started doing my technique, um, not muscle memory, but the technique came with my tactical 
playing style. So I knew exactly what to hit because I've been doing the technique in those two, so two shot sequences. So I think my technique improved because we were actually playing the point and I was able to um, connect it with the point style. The perception we're trying to shine a light onto, it's not how much repetition, although that, that counts. It's what kind of repetition. There's a disconnect between what happens on the match court and how you feel and how, how you feel when you play a shot, how you feel when you play that forehand, when you play that backhand slice like fifth, and then, and then doing it on the, mat, on the practice court, right? How do you practice that backhand slice like fifth on the practice court? versus how you've got to hit it on a match court. And we've got, to, we've got to close the gap. I think we're doing a better job, um, at least at the Art of Winning. We know we're doing a better job because that's what we promote and, and we, we have coach, work with coaches on helping them become better and then players helping them be, build confidence and competitive intelligence. That's what we're all about here. And that's, what we, that's the message we want to share, you know, with the coaching world, the playing world, the tennis world. Dan, can you talk a little bit and wrap us up with how do you feel like this has helped sort of the players that have never really played matches that are coming to you, maybe they're adults, um, or even the little kids. You can talk about, you know, the tennis tigers, the five to sevens, but how's this affecting them? You know, they're, it's, they're, yeah, it feel, it, it's very much like I am now giving them knowledge rather than trying to program them in a particular way and teach them technical stuff. It's very much, look, it's, it, I, I feel like I am giving them what I should have always been giving them, which was the knowledge and how, do, how do, you know, what, what am I looking for? Right? So the, so the player knows what to do in a match. The problem was we were teaching players and not, telling them, giving them any knowledge about what to do in a match, okay? That, and that was, the, it sounds, uh, the reason I'm fumbling around trying to explain that is mainly because it's so simple, right? They didn't know what to do. My friend, a, a colleague of mine, Jeff Taylor, he's, he teaches chess, right? And he said the number one barrier, right, to, to winning chess matches and the problem that chess players face they don't know what to do at a certain point. That's it. So his job is to give them the knowledge, right? So given this pattern, that's how you do it, right? So we are giving people knowledge and they love that. Because I can tell you the biggest, the biggest way of kind of getting rid of the emotional response, which is always entirely negative, right? You very rarely get someone go, oh, Dan, I responded emotionally, and it was brilliant, yeah? And this is the problem. Coaches will prime you. They go, or, or, or you know, a lot of this, the, the, the mental toughness stuff, and coaches will say, oh, we're going to be big. You, you know, you've got to have a real positive mental attitude. In other words, you're going to big up the emotions, yeah? That never works. Emotions can't win a match. Knowledge wins a match. Knowing what to do will win a match. That's the big, big difference. The other thing knowledge does, and that includes reason and it includes counting, right, is it gets rid of anxiety. Right? Courage and the ability to come through difficult situations and deal with uncertainty, yeah, and knowledge, go, they go together. Knowledge and courage go together. That and that pushes aside the um uh the emotion the anxiety and the, the, the emotions are useless in the tennis match so i'm not going to get you anywhere okay knowledge does and um yeah so they kind of work together right that 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 is what i would say has been the huge difference people people have the the look competing is difficult it re does require courage people know now what to do and that gives them the courage. It's like anything you do, if you're a soldier, if you, you know, the Marines, they know what to do in combat situations. They know what to do in combat situations, right? Boom, boom, boom. We, we run through that. That's the big difference. So that's, that's going to wrap up our episode today with what kind of repetition do you need to be better and to win more matches? 
Um, go ahead and, and, and scroll over to the art of, uh, to art of winning tennis.com. That's where our membership portal lies. There's videos there that you can watch. There's some free resources as well. Uh, we'd love to have you as a part of the art of winning team, whether you're a player or a coach, if you want more information about getting some hands-on coaching from Dan or I or one of Art of Winning coaches, you'll find us there at theartofwinningtennis.com. Um, but thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Trinity, for all your player insight. That was awesome. Uh, it's brilliant. always great. Yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. It's always good to hear from someone who's actually experienced it as a player, you know, growing up. Um, and achieving your goal. So congratulations on your, your you know, going to play at the school of your choice in college. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you next time on the other side.